It's now time for member's statement. And I recognize the member for Mississauga, Erin Mills. Very proud to announce that work is finally underway on Taos Common Community Centre in my riding of Mississauga, Erin Mills. I was happy to join the mayor, city councillors, and construction workers for the groundbreaking for this exciting redevelopment project. The Ontario government is investing over $45 million to reconstruct the South Common Community Centre. The new facility will include an aquatic centre, a fitness centre, an enlarged gymnasium, and a 16,000 square foot library. This is exciting news for the community in Saga Erin Mills, and we cannot wait to see this centre returning to public use in the near future. Speaker, I also attended Trillium Health Partners Foundation annual Diwali Gala fundraiser. The goal was raising funds for the Peter Galligan Mississauga Hospital and the great work of THB in Mississauga. We are building the biggest hospital in Canada history, Canada's history with the largest emergency room in Canada. They are also operating Wilbrook Place, a newly opened long-term care facility with 632 state-of-the-art long-term care beds. And just the other week, I visited Ivan Franco Ukrainian Homes in my riding with the Minister of Long-Term Care. That facility of 160 safe modern beds is well under construction and will be finished soon. Lots of infrastructure is coming to Mississauga, and we are very excited to see our community flourishing. Excellent. Thank you. Next member's statement, the member from Thunder Bay, Superior North. Thank you, Speaker. The addictions crisis is hard on everyone, hard on those living in encampments and hard on those worried about safety in their neighbourhoods. But the closure of consumption treatment sites goes against the recommendations of the province's own experts, and that is because these sites improve community safety and save lives. 465 lives in Thunder Bay alone, 465 people who did not need emergency services, and 465 people who lived long enough to get access to other supports. In 2018, it was the province that approved Thunder Bay's Path 525, knowing its exact location. A year ago, the province paid for significant capital renovations, and the service completed and implemented a community safety strategy as required by the province. So why the sudden change of direction? to win votes by creating scapegoats, to distract from the government's failures to address the levels of homelessness and poverty not seen since the Great Depression. People whose lives have been saved by harm reduction sites have gone on to become community leaders, but only because sites like Path 525 helped them stay alive until they were able to gain control over their addictions. Addictions affect people from all walks of life, including many working in the trades with high-paying jobs. It's time to end the stereotyping and end the stigma. Harm reduction is one of the four essential pillars of care, and if the experts, including those with lived experience, are listened to, Path 525 in Thunder Bay will stay open. Thank you. Thank you. Next member's statement. The member for Sault Ste. Marie. Thanks for that wonderful applause. Uh, thank you, everyone. And thank you, uh, <clears throat> Madam Speaker. Uh, this morning, I'm uh, excited to chat with you a little bit. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry. <clears throat> Seem to have a hairball. Um, I want to chat a little bit about uh, my alma mater, Algoma University. I was very excited this past summer. Uh, for many of you who know me and uh, my family, we are very close and tight to the game of soccer. Uh, very, very uh, actively involved in that. Algoma University, my alma mater, uh, joined the OUA uh, several years ago, and this year was a pretty productive year for the Algoma University uh, men's Thunderbird soccer team. Uh, this year they experienced their first ever two wins of the season. Now, they only had two this year. They didn't make the playoffs, but it was still pretty exciting. They defeated uh, the York University team, uh, who was uh, at one point number one ranked in the uh, OUA. Uh, they also defeated uh, the Windsor University's uh, soccer team. Uh, the women's team didn't uh, fare so well with the victories. They only had four ties on the year, but still a very, very productive year for the girls' team as well. And just something very notable for the university. Coming from uh, school, when I was attending there as a full-time student, we were still members of the Laurentian. Uh, we were the little sister or little brother university to that institution. We've come quite a long way, and here we are 
are defeating the likes of York University, Windsor University, and I'm hoping next year we'll be able to make the playoffs for the first time in their history. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Next member's statement, the member for Sudbury. Thank you very much, Speaker. Speaker, on Saturday I celebrated Garbo with Sudbury's Gujarati community. It was organized by Sudbury's Canadian Guju Cultural Association of Northern Ontario. And thanks to people like my friend Jay Mahida, I learn more about Garba every single year and I'm grateful to have those experiences. Speaker, Garba is a form of dance, but it's also a religious and social event that originates in Gujarat, uh, India. Garba is performed during Navaratri, the longest and largest dance festival in the world. Uh, Navaratri actually means nine nights. It's the Hindu festival dedicated to Durga, the feminine form of divinity and her nine forms from the fierce sword wielding Kalaratri to the smiling creator of the universe, Kushmanda. Garba is also layered with a lot of symbolism of the feminine divine and the cyclical, cyclical nature of life. For example, Garba is performed in a circle which represents the cycle of time from birth to life to death to rebirth. It's also common to dance barefoot at Garba as a sign of respect for the earth. Uh, Sudbury's Garba night had a lot of dancing, community, respect, camaraderie, and of course a lot of food. Uh, it was incredibly fun. I, I, I literally could not so, stop smiling the entire evening. And my apologies to everyone whose feet I may have stepped on while trying to learn the <laughs> traditional dances. I, I want to thank again the Canadian Gujarati Cultural Association of Northern Ontario for hosting such a wonderful and inclusive event and I'm grateful to have been part of it. Thank you, Speaker. Excellent. Thank you. Next member statement, the member for Flamerol Danbrook. Well, good morning, Madam Speaker. Today I would like to highlight a wonderful organization in my riding, Choices Association Incorporated. Choices works to provide supports that will enhance the quality of life for people living with developmental disabilities. Through the promotion of self-worth and social inclusion, they ensure that the people they support have opportunities to live and to participate in their communities. Earlier this month, I met with the team at Choices to hear more about the $118,000 that they received through the Ontario Trillium Foundation's Resilient Communities Fund. The grant has helped fund the hiring of a health services connector, as well as the purchase of equipment and the renovation of space to better provide in-house support for participants. During my visit, I had the opportunity to hear several inspirational stories, such as the one from Michael Jacques. Michael is an inspiring young adult with autism and an intellectual disability. His story truly is inspirational. Despite the inability to read or write, Michael is the author of Here's My Book, a book written by using an iPad speech-to-text function. It's a collection of life stories and discoveries that teach people to embrace and celebrate their differences. Organizations such as Choices are what make Flamborough Glanbrook such a great place to live and the people that they support, such as Michael, are influential members of our community, which I am so proud to recognize today. Thank you. Thank you. Next member statement, member for the next coming Calcum. Thank you, Speaker. As we uh, are in the house today, all wearing poppies, um, I'm reminded of a trip I took this summer. We went to visit uh, my wife's family in the Netherlands, and my brother-in-law, Bram, uh, took me to Belgium, to West Flanders, to the city of Ypres. And the region of West Flanders looks an awful lot like Southern Ontario. There's towns dotted here and there, large commercial farms, large livestock farms, but the one thing that's different, it's also dotted with graveyards. At the one gravesite we stopped, there were 12,500 headstones. And behind the headstones, there was a granite wall with 100,000 names in it who were people who were never identified. And between those headstones, there were poppies growing. And the poem came to my head in Flanders fields where poppies blow between the crosses, row upon row. It made me think of all the people who have suffered, who have died. But that happened before the Second World War. 
before Nazism. We, we, aren't, we don't seem to be learning. And I wish that everyone had the opportunity, and that's why I'm sharing today, to stand there in Flanders Fields and watch the poppies blow. Thank you for that opportunity. Thank you. Next member statement, the member for Oakville Nord, uh, Burlington, no, sorry, Oakville Nord, Burlington. Thank you, Speaker. Last week was Small Business Week, and it was time to celebrate the entrepreneurs who are driving Ontario's economy. These small businesses do more than just provide goods and services. They create jobs and strengthen the vibrant communities we proudly represent. Behind every business is an entrepreneur with a vision. Recently, I had the pleasure of joining Small Business Minister Nina Tangri to announce our government's $2 million investment in Futurepreneur, supporting 300 young, young entrepreneurs in launching new businesses and creating nearly 1,200 new jobs. I also visited four fantastic women-owned small businesses in Oakville, North Burlington, which had recently opened their doors. Mel's Diner, Daylight Bar and Grill, The Blue Cafe, and Osteo Strong, as well as Guiding Light Autism Services and Bombay Grocers. Each has brought their vision to life and contributed to the local community and economy. These success stories are great examples of what can happen when entrepreneurs have access to the right supports, right resources, and opportunities to grow. Speaker, I look forward to more of these visits as we proudly stand with Ontario's entrepreneurs. We're committed to ensuring they have every opportunity to succeed and keep building a stronger Ontario for all. Because when entrepreneurs succeed, Ontario succeeds. Thank you. Next member statements. I recognize the member for Brantford Brant. Thank you, Speaker, and good morning. I am pleased to rise today to speak about the incredible investments that our government is making in the Brant community health care system. Speaker, Brantford General Hospital serves over 120,000 people in my riding and beyond by providing state-of-the-art programs via teams of incredible doctors, nurses, and other health care professionals. The hard work that these health care workers do each and every day ensures a high level of patient-focused care. However, Speaker, Brantford General's Hospital's age and deteriorating state hinders the efforts made by these incredible individuals. Speaker, that is why our government has invested a substantial $23 million this year alone in critical infrastructure at Brantford General Hospital. Hospital officials have said that these funds have been essential in repairing the hospital's utility tunnel and boiler systems, ensuring a safe and reliable environment for patients, families and staff. Speaker, this is crucial to maintaining a high quality patient care and underscore the importance of well-maintained hospital infrastructure. As the Brantford Brant community looks forward to the future and plans to redevelop and build our <coughs> hospital sites, this investment marks a vital step to sustaining operations at the hospital. And I would also, Speaker, be remiss if I did not extend a thank you to the Brant Community Healthcare System CEO, Bonnie Cam, who identified the issues with the hospital and let us know how and what we needed to fix. Thank you, Bonnie, and the entire team at the Brant Community Healthcare System for everything that you do for our community and keeping us healthy. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you very much. Member Statements, the member for Nepean. Thank you very much, Speaker. In 2006, I stepped into this hallowed chamber. I had a baby cradled in my arms as Bob Runciman and John Tory walked me through that door. We were joined by Peter Tavins, although not in the same party, he became a great friend of mine. <laughs> And I have to say, he touched me this morning when he told me that when his mother passed away this past September, she had a picture of me and him in her funeral proceedings. But I hearken back to that day because it was a day of hope and it was a day of promise. It was marked with the presence of many great people. And it was fun to be 
together embarking on the journey. And as Christine Elliott and I walked into the chamber, we sat behind the stalwart Ted Arnott and the spirited Garfield Dunlop. Now, of course, we had to blush, and the speaker now knows what I'm talking about. We had to blush, he did as well, because Garfield loudly proclaimed that we had taken our seats behind the eye candy of the legislature. <laughs> okay, and in the spirit of the humor that characterizes all of our time here, the late Bill Murdoch, with a devilish twinkle in his eye, took out his dentures in front of Christine and I, <laughs> leaving the late Jerry Martinuck in, st Martinuck in stitches. And of course, anybody that knew Jerry knew he had a belly full of laughs. Um, I've come to realize that after those first five minutes of my inaugural question period, that Queen's Park wasn't merely a compilation of people uh, from p different parts that we were actually a living, breathing embodiment of each new member, just like Z and Tyler and Steve, with each a fresh perspective and a new idea that they brought forward to this place. And all of that was woven with the experience like John Yakubuski. It's a place enriched by those who have weathered the storms of public opinion, as I certainly have, and electoral change, as I have seen over the past 20 years in this assembly. This place is magical not for the routine proceedings or the motions that we engage in, but it is because of the vibrant humanity that fills it. It's a place filled with shared laughter, questions asked, debates ignited, and I must say, Speaker, I have seen that commitment and dedication to each of those of us who have chosen to serve. That's why the true magic lies in our differences, the unique stories each of us brings, and it's a gift to us fortunate enough to be elected to this assembly. The experiences that I've had that come to mind are vast and exciting and some not. But I'll never forget the day that John Yakubuski, Steve Clark and I were the surprise musical guests at an NDP caucus meeting. <laughs> where expectations ran pretty high because their crowd spends time with the bare naked ladies and we didn't walk in naked and uh, there was only one lady. <laughs> but the best part of that when we surprised everyone was a great mashup of country singing by Yak and of course Rosie o Marchese singing a type of opera that none of us had ever heard before. And that night we got the John Vantoff two thumbs up. Oh. <laughs> and then there were the nights that were spent in the West Lobby as we shut down the Ontario Legislature over the HST. Tim Hudak, oh. Randy Hillier, and again Murdoch sang Johnny Cash songs off key. We were united at that time in our defiance and of the HST and myself and Norm Miller brought in 500,000 amendments to the HST. But there were also more weighty moments and the trials that tested us. When Kathleen Wood Wynne stood firm during, during the terrorist attack on Parliament Hill, she refused to shut down the legislature during a time of national crisis. We came together in this assembly as a family. We were united in navigating the storm and unity and strength of Ontario came shining through on that particular day. We faced losses as Bruce Crozier, Crozier departed just days after our heartfelt farewells. Jim Flaherty passed and left indelible marks in each of our hearts while his, his wife, Christine, was leading our question period. Gordy Brown's death was felt in real time in this chamber as Steve Clark notified our entire country and became a strong shoulder for Eleanor McMahon who crossed the floor to grieve. And yes, COVID-19 tested us all. But amid the challenges, we found some sweeter moments, like the privilege of witnessing Sol Mamakwa speak an Indigenous language in this house for the first time, a transcendent moment that honoured the richness and heritage of the place we call home. Babies have been born to our members, others have become grandparents, and still others have left for higher office while serving. I've had some health difficulties, and some of the most comforting gestures were the warmth of a visit from, to my office from former Premier Dalton McGuinty, the thoughtful notes from Jim Bradley, Sherry DeNovo, 
Suze Morrison. And I'm going to out you here, Jill Andrew, <laughs> with sweet and gentle moments, but also my colleague, Will Boma, and his wife, Joni. These are the moments that are some of the best, the funniest, and the most humbling, and the most genuine of my life. It's been a profound gift to share these experiences with each one of you. I am always remembering one other thing that didn't make it into this final speech, but I have to talk about John Frazier for one moment. <laughs> Good looking guy. He actually puts his face on his uh, election posters. And I have never drew a funny face on one of them. <laughs> but I will say this, the guy's got some humor. We were at a concussion event in 2015, and John got up to speak, and I said, who can say no to that face? He said, 24,962 people who didn't vote for me in the last election. <laughs> now, Tim Hudak, no, I did the math last night. <laughs> John, you just realized what you should have a long time ago that Joe Varner probably should have told you. I always get the last word. <laughs> uh, but as I conclude, I want to say Tim Hudak reminded me of the platform that we all hold. And John Tory taught me something that is important for all of us to know too. Life unfolds in chapters. I stand here comfortable in the knowledge that I have had both. And I want to say this to each one of you, you do as well. I want to say in my last statement here in this legislature, my deepest appreciation to each of you. Every single one of you I look at, you've given me a story, you've given me life. And despite what you might think when I'm in question period, I do look at each one of you with deep admiration and affection. Even when you may have been my harshest critic, and that usually came from this side. <laughs> I learned a great deal from you. Thank you very much, and uh, look forward to watching all of you succeed in life. Introduction to visitors.